Okay. So I hope you can take another half an hour of my talking. Uh, this is a different project. Uh, and uh, it's quite recent. Um, it's a collaboration with other people, University of California, Irvine. Uh, Kimberly Jason, Jameson is a psychologist who is interested in color. And Louis Narens, uh, Louis Narens and Ragnar Stangerson are both philosophers. So uh, I'll be talking about color categorization in people and uh, some evolutionary and mathematical uh, aspects of those. So first of all, let me tell you about um, how we perceive color. The, the, the wealth of different colors that uh, we can perceive can be uh, represented in a three-dimensional space, a three-dimensional solid. So imagine a globe, um, and from uh, north to south is uh, white to black. So that, that's the lightness. Uh, going inside is saturation, ending up with gray in the very middle, and more saturated colors on the outside. And the equator is the colors of the rainbow red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and it closes uh, at the purple. And let's consider the skin of the globe, which has uh, all of the colors of the rainbow in the most uh, saturated uh, varieties, red, orange, yellow, and so on. And um, uh, there were various studies uh, looking at how different cultures categorize and name their colors. So um, there, the Different languages have different numbers of uh, basic color terms. And uh, let me first tell you what basic means. So um, in English, they say we have 11 basic color terms. Of, of course, there are many more words for color than 11. But things like beige or burnt sienna, people don't agree upon, uh, especially men. So th there's a, a study that shows that women are more aware of their colors than men. But if you look at the population as a whole, there is a lot of disagreement on those uh, color terms. However, everybody knows what are the basic color terms. And in English, I'll give an example. It's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, the colors of the rainbow. There is black, white, and gray. There is brown and pink. So these are all the colors that everybody knows what they are. OK, so uh, the smallest number of colors that uh, has ever been recorded in languages is two. And there are two types of cultures uh, that have only two basic color terms. Uh, one uh, discriminates between dark and light only. And interestingly, another way to split this, uh, so they basically split this only into two regions, uh, dark and uh, light. The other one splits them into warm and cold. Warm being these colors, and this is cold. OK, so, um, but uh, if you look at different cultures, there are other cases. So this map depicts uh, a language with three uh, color terms. And uh, whenever there is a culture with three color terms, it's usually black, white, and red. OK, there are languages with four color terms. It's usually yellow that comes next. Uh, five, the fifth color is usually something that is between uh, blue and green and so on. So here are the blue and green split. Uh, so there are many universal features uh, about different languages and how they ca categorize their colors. But of course, there are vast variations. Uh, and so a good theory of color categorization has to accomplish two tasks. It has to explain the universality and at the same time somehow account, account for the differences uh, uh, among cultures. So. Um, the existing view of color belongs to K2005. Color ca categor categories are organized around universal focal colors. So this explains regularities in different cultures. So we, the biology of people you know, uh, sets the um, focal colors. But uh, it fails to explain uh, variations. So my, my colleague, Kimberly Jameson, uh, came up with a, a different explanation or a different idea of uh, how we could uh, reason about color categorization. So color c categorization reflects some uh, optimal divisions of uh, a perceptual color space. Okay, so it's up to an applied mathematician to understand what this 
optimization problem is, right? And to, to give some, you know, rigor to the statement. So, um, and uh, in this talk, I'll do that. I'll, I'll uh, set up an optimization problem and show you how this can lead to something reasonable. And uh, this talk will ignore a lot of things about color. For instance, um, there are all these influences that uh, um, change uh, our, the ways we talk about color, like linguistic influences, environmental, cultural. So uh, we will uh, concentrate on something uh, much simpler than this. So uh, we'll look at some pragmatic considerations. And uh, so here's a simple idea. Objects of similar colors are likely to have similar properties, right? And objects of different colors are likely to have different properties. So it is useful to call similar colors the same name, and it's useful to call faraway colors different names. Very simple. And it's also useful to be able to communicate with others, with others about those colors. So these principles uh, um, comprise the basis of a, a theory uh, that uh, I'll tell you. So pragmatic considerations. Here's an apple. And I tell you, can you please go and bring me uh, an apple of the same color from the tree? And uh, I can tell you for sure there, that there is no apple of the same color on that tree because all colors are different, more or less, right? So same doesn't mean the same. It means close. So if I say, can you bring me the apple of the same color? If, op, if you bring this, this means that communication was correct. If you bring this, it wasn't correct. So it has to be correct within bounds, right? So uh, let's look at the skin of the color uh, solid again. And um, I don't want to talk about the three-dimensional space of colors. Uh, I, I simplify the model as much as possible. So I take the hue circle, that's the equator more or less of, of the globe. Okay, and I define color categorization as a matrix on this very simple color space. So my color space is a circle. And I have a matrix that tells me the probability that I'll call this color one of these uh, words. Okay, so red, orange, yellow, for instance, green, blue, purple. And, uh, or it could be A, B, C, D, and so on. They add up to one. And an artificial, uh, uh, an artificial agent uh, in the simulations that I'll present, uh, each artificial uh, agent is equipped uh, with a matrix like this, that, that is uh, uh, its color categorization. Okay, so um, we're not talking about the language as a whole. We're talk about, talking about colors only. Um, so the agents will be play, playing uh, language games. Uh, and uh, the game is like this. Let's suppose two color chips are picked from a distribution. So I have this color circle. I pick two color chips and I present the two agents, uh, or one agent w w with the color chips. And uh, let's suppose that the chips are near nearby. They're a similar color. If the agent categorizes them as the same category, then the game is success. And if he categorizes them into different categories, it's a failure. So an agent uses his co uh, categorization matrix to assign a category to each of the chips. If it's the same category, uh, the game ends up in a success. And if the chips are far apart, then uh, it's, it's the opposite. So uh, what does it mean, uh, close and far? So I have to introduce a parameter. There's a, going to be only one parameter uh, in this model. Case similarity, okay, so uh, if I have um, a color circle, I put a certain measure in it, and uh, this parameter tells me which color chips are considered to be close and which are considered to be far for my purposes. Um, so uh, case similarity is basically the minimum difference between the color chips for which it becomes important to treat them for pragmatic purposes as different color categories. So it's different from uh, the so-called just noticeable difference. So uh, if two color chips are within case similarity of each other, it doesn't mean that I cannot distinguish them. I can see that they're different colors. The, the, they're different shades of the same color, say. But I choose to call them the same name, OK? Or it's, it's pragmatically useful to call them the same name. OK, so if the two chips are like this, for success, I need to put this in the same category. And if they're like this, for success of the game, I have to put them in a different category. So these are the rules of the game. And let's see what, uh, when I implement this, what it gives me. So um, 
I want to define success rate. So I play this game many, many times, and I count the number of successful games. Uh, and I take the limit as n goes to infinity. So the uh, fraction of uh, successful games uh, is uh, called S. And I call the success rate. And this is the quanti quantity that I want to optimize. Remember, my theory was that color categorization in people is supposed to optimize something. So what I want to optimize in this game is the success rate. Okay. So um, the optimal categorization is the one that maximizes the probability of success of discrimination communication games. Uh, and uh, the corresponding um, categorization matrix can be found theoretically in the simplest scenario scenarios, and otherwise we can study the evolutionary dynamics numerically. So uh, the analytical solution in the simplest scenario is like this. So if this is my color space, to maximize the success game, I have to have a certain number of color categories, which are joint sets like this, okay? And uh, the optimal categorization has to be deterministic. So in my big matrix, I always have to call the same color, the same name, okay? So. Uh, uh, determinist, deterministic categorization uh, maximizes the success rate. Uh, it, uh, categories have equal size, and each uh, is connect, a connected set of chips, and I can ca calculate the number of color categories that gives me the optimum. So this is my only parameter that I have. The, this is the length, the, the size of my color space, and this, this is the number of color words, basically, that this population has to develop to maximize the success rate, okay? Uh, and uh, the, ca the categorization solutions of the population uh, are rotationally invariant. What does it mean? So uh, this is my color space, uh, and let's suppose that the optimal number of uh, color terms is four, so each of these solutions is as good as any other, right? If, if I rotate it by any uh, number of chips, I still get an optimal solution. So if this mechanism took place in humans, uh, it would mean that if we look at the color circle, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, different color uh, cultures uh, would have different co color borders. They would, uh, there would not be a, a single place where people would dis discriminate between red and the next color orange. However, if we look across cultures, if there are colors red and yellow, they, they uh, have a divide approximately at the same place. Okay, so there is no rotational invariance in human color categorization, and it exists here. So, um, uh, oh, and uh, uh, just to mention that success rate in these games can never be one, because I have to have borders between color, color categories. And if the two chips come very close to uh, uh, a border, but uh, they belong to different color categories. That's a failure of the game. But uh, it's, an, it's a necessary failure, uh, given the design of the games. So um, let's talk about evolutionary dynamics. Before, I was only talking about one individual who has his own color categorization. And now let's put agents together and have them communicate about color. So a player starts um, from a random categorization. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, before we introduce the population, I want to introduce learning. Okay, so first uh, we introduce evolution and then we introduce populations. So uh, a player starts from a random categorization of colors, so a random matrix uh, whose uh, entries add up to one in the, in the uh, columns. Rounds of the discrimination game are played, and in case of success, the category is strengthened, and in case of failure, it's weakened. So here's an example. Let's suppose we only have two color terms. Um, L for light and D for dark. A categorization looks like this. So these are my color, uh, color chips, the, the samples uh, of the color space. And uh, an individual agent, um, for instance, this particular agent uh, will call color one light with probability 25%, and it, he will call it dark with probability 75%. Uh, the same agent calls color two light or dark 50-50, uh, chance 50-50. So this is uh, 
a graphical representation of this agent's categorization matrix. Okay, so let's start the game. Let's suppose I picked these two chips, and they're very close to each other. They're within k similarity of each other. So for success of the game, he has to categorize them as the same category. So he flips a coin here, and he flips a coin here, and he assigns dark to color one and light to color two. That's a failure of the game. So as a result of this, uh, he has to update his categorization matrix, right? So he has to lower the probability to call this color dark. He called it dark and it failed. So we want to lower the probability to call it dark next time. And he lowers the probability of calling this light. So the new matrix will look like this. So this has gone down, this has gone down, the other one has gone up. So that's one round of uh, this. It's a learning procedure. And uh, we've tried, all, tried many different types of uh, learning algorithms, including memoryless learner. Uh, so this is just uh, something that worked, and uh, it, it's really learn, learner independent, but this is just an example, just to uh, show you something solid. Okay, so we play rounds of individual discrimination game. So the agent starts from uh, a categorization uh, which includes all colors, so he, I, I assume a random matrix, so he can call each color anything with uh, more or less equal probabilities. And we go through rounds and rounds and rounds, and in the end, we have this nice color categorization. So this shows that he'll call these colors, uh, all of these chips will be called this, uh, for instance, A, this will be called B, this will be called C, and so on. Okay, so uh, we have an evolutionary dynamics that leads to a reasonable color categorization in the end. Uh, and this uh, result coincides with my theoretical prediction of the optimal color categorization. Remember, I told you that I can calculate uh, analytically the, the optimal number of color categories. So these agents will converge to that analytical solution as time goes by. Uh, so that's another way to represent it. These are 50 color chips. We call it all sorts of things in the beginning, and in the end, we get something like this. Uh, so now we need to add communication. So different agents talk to each other about the color. Uh, two individuals play the discrimination game, just as before. I give them two chips, and bo they both name them. Okay? If one succeeded and the other failed, then the failed individual learns from the successful one. So he updates his categories to match them more closely to uh, the ones of the other one. If both succeeded, then the teacher is chosen at random, and uh, so they kind of uh, agree up, up, upon one of the solutions. If both fail, then both update their categorization as in the individual uh, categorization game. So we have a whole number of agents. So I show three of them, and uh, we run the, cate the categorization communication game a lot of times. And in the end, we can see that all the agents have the same categorization, and again, it looks like the one that is predicted theoretically. So we have a population convergence to a common solution with very good degree of agreement in the population. And uh, uh, it, it agrees with the theoretical solution. So, um, but the only problem, as I said, is the rotational invariance. Sometimes I run this, and it ends up um, so, so the, the, the places where the color borders uh, occur at the end, when the population settles to a certain uh, categorization, that's random. Uh, and uh, here's uh, a way to study this. So let's suppose that uh, my optimal solution is five categories. It, this means that when I run it a thousand times, sometimes I get four, sometimes I get five, sometimes I get six. Most of the time I get five. So I, I take all these runs, and I uh, note and I, plot, and I plot a histogram where the color borders occur. Okay, and uh, this is the locations of the color borders. These things from run to run, so they occur everywhere. There, there's no specific place where they occur. And here's an example. Let's look at um, a wheel of fortune. I rotate it. And I will be recording the number that ends up to be the lowest point. 
and I record it a thousand times, and I'll get a histogram of something like this. Any number can end up below a strand. There is no, this is called uh, symmetry of the system, rotational invariance. Uh, so I want to get rid of that, and I will introduce inhomogeneities in the population. So, so far, the, we have a homogeneous population of agents uh, and a homogeneous color space. And I will introduce the inhomogeneity in the population and also inhomogeneity in the color space. So what is inhomogeneity in the population? I will talk about dichromat agents. Dichromat is the same as colorblind, uh, but it, it's more, uh, you know, uh, the, the scientific way of, of saying is dichromat, that there are very, various uh, types of them. This is a test that they give you, the doctor. If you can read 5, 8, 29, and 74, you're not a dichromat. 8% of men will be dichromats, okay? They, they will not be able to uh, pass this test. So it's, uh, and women almost never get this because of the genetic reasons. Uh, so about 4% of the population uh, typically are, dichro are dichromats. Uh, so the color space of dichromats is different from the color space of uh, uh, regular observers. So regular observers have a color circle, and for dichromats, this color and this color look the same. So this color space gets squished. And in the most minimal um, model of a dichromat, only this color chip looks the same as this one. So we get the number eight as the color space. Maybe it's a number of color chips that look the same. Then we have something like this. And if half of the color looks as, as the same as the other one, we have this most extreme case. So this is, these are various ways of modeling. And of course, uh, this is usually uh, red and uh, green. Okay, so they it always get squished in the same direction. That's, that's introducing a certain axis um, in, in the population. So um, we uh, can put those in the model at a small percentage, okay? And, uh, and we run uh, the pop population game. The normal agent in the whole population will converge to the same color categorization, which looks like this, something like this. And the dichromat will have a categorization that is not deterministic. So he will always call these colors yellow. He will always call these colors uh, blue. But he, these colors, he sometimes will call uh, red, sometimes green. And same with green, right? So uh, the a small percentage of the population will have a different color categorization. It won't be deterministic, but as a population, uh, people will mostly have this uh, stable color solution. Now, um, so again, it looks like this. Uh, and uh, I'm going to look, be looking at the color boundaries that result uh, from such simulations. And again, four, five, and six category solutions. I'm going to be recording the uh, locations of the boundaries. And this is my old picture without dichromats. Colors occur everywhere. Now, if I add more and more dichromats in the population, 8% is, uh, uh, oh, so the, the, the realistic is somewhere here. Look what I have, for instance, for, with four uh, category solutions. The borders, color borders are always at the same place. So the population always converges to a, a, a categorization solution that is characterized by the same borders, same, uh, same color borders. So the uh, uh, rotational invariance is gone almost completely. It's, it's very much reduced even if I add only 1% of dichromats here, right? You will already see large uh, uh, peaks in this histogram. So uh, with the Ferris wheel, it's like putting a weight on one of the axes. Now if I spin it, it will always uh, end, uh, end up having this number at the bottom. So instead of a uniform distribution on this histogram, I'll get a one peak distribution, breaking of the rotational symmetry. Um, so that's what dichromats do. Uh, by having um, one axis that is special, for instance, uh, axis of non-confusion, what, what we call it, from uh, yellow to blue. Uh, so this is a non-ambiguous axis, and um, it so happens that um, the boundaries of, of uh, the categorizations get anchored by the existence of this axis. Uh, okay. 
so uh, the presence of dichromats also uh, may change a little bit the uh, number of uh, typical number of co color categories, but not much. So uh, the summary here is that uh, for different degrees of dichromat impairment and different proportions of impaired agents, the statistics of solutions change, uh, and um, access of no confusions and uh, attracts, and the axis of confusion repels color boundaries. So by uh, looking at where the axis of no confusion is, we can predict where the color boundaries uh, are going to be. Um, and uh, uh, another heterogeneity that uh, I'm going to introduce is the inhomogeneity of the color space, what we call regions of increased salience. So um, it can be argued that in the color space, some regions are more important. Uh, so for instance, it doesn't matter what shade of purple something is. I can call all the purples purple. But with red, it's very important to determine different types of fruit. So uh, my game similarity, uh, this measure, has to be smaller in a certain region of the color space. And that's the result of a lifestyle or some biological uh, you know, uh, consequence of uh, bi bi biological constraints. So uh, if I arrange for my cave similarity, this one parameter, to be, for instance, smaller in one part of the color space than the others, then uh, my population solution will look exactly as expected. I'll have larger categories where it's not very important to discriminate colors, and I'll have smaller color categories within this region of increased salience. Moreover, of course, the presence of this region will anchor the boundaries such that, I, again, I will lose my rotational uh, uh, symmetry and now the color boundaries will always end up in the same place. Uh, so here is a, a histogram which are in the absence of dichromats but in the presence of a region of increased salience. So now uh, these are the locations of uh, color boundaries and they always end up, 100% end up in this place um, and they're anchored by the presence of the region of increased salience. Um, okay, so I can get the different types of solutions, five category solutions, six category solutions, but uh, we always see that uh, more color categories fit inside this region. Uh, so for uh, homogeneous populations, uh, region of increased salience removes, solutional, uh, uh, removes the rotational invariance of the solutions. Uh, categories are refined by this region, and the number of categories um, can vary. So in fact, it turns out that the region of increased salience and dichromats act uh, upon language evolution in a similar way. Um, they both re remove rotational invariance and they can change category number and sizes, but uh, they do it by, in a different way. So uh, re the region of increased salience removes rotational invariance by aligning category boundaries with uh, this region, and uh, it changes category number uh, such that the smaller categories fit inside this region. The presence of dichromats removes rotational invariance by aligning category boundaries with the ambiguity axis, and it changes category number and sizes according to the non-ambiguous axis orientation. So now uh, we can consider uh, a population of normals and dichromats with a color space that includes a region of increased salience. Okay, uh, so this is region of increased salience, and we add uh, so in in the absence of dichromats, we have this kind of a solution that is anchored by this region. Now we add dichromats, and they have this axis of uh, non ambiguous axis which, which repels color color boundaries. So it has to change. The solution has to shift and extend in response to the presence of dichromats. Even a small percentage of dichromats will do this. Okay. Uh, so for a uniform color space and homogeneous population of viewers, the categorization is a rotational invariant equipartitioning of the circle. In the presence of inhomogeneities in the color space or in the population, the color boundaries are fixed and color categories may have different size. Dichromats align the color categories along the non-ambiguous non axis, uh, and different populations uh, around the world uh, may differ uh, according to these two types of inhomogeneity. So different co populations can, may have 
different regions of increase, increased salience. It depends on the lifestyle. And they may have different types of color vision variability. It, it, it's known that, uh, um, so the, the numbers that I gave you, 8% of males, uh, uh, is uh, in Europe and North America, right? In other populations, these numbers are different, and types of dichromats are different. So this theory has a potential to explain the observed variations in color categorization. Thank you very much.